Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Vocast. I'm your host, Drew. Today, we've got another guest with us for session 11, Mr. Elliot Robinson. What's up, man? It's good to have him, guys. If you guys don't know much about him, you're gonna today's your lucky day. We're going to learn more about him today. If, for, for those that don't know him, he has a extremely low voice, has been singing bass for several years, and can you kind of give us a brief explanation of uh, your history with music? Oh, man. How much time we got? <laughs> as much time as you want. Yeah, man. Um, I mean, professionally, right? So I've been doing and doing acapella for most of my musical career, if you will. And that's been, I guess I would say I started about 20 years ago um, as far as being engaged with it, but on a semi-pro or pro level, more like 15 or 16. Okay. So, you know, studied music in college from my undergrad and um, had a really interesting path through and after school. Um, but yeah, I mean, pretty much right after undergrad, professionally involved in acapella and just never really fully stopped. Gotcha, gotcha. So like I said, folks, as you can tell, he's got a very low voice. He's very well known for this and he's been a bass singer for how many groups now? <laughs> The lost count, and as far as an actual <laughs> member, maybe five, but I've either subbed or collabed with <laughs> dozens, you know, dozens. So, like I said, we're gonna be learning a lot about him today. So, with that said, we're gonna d jump right into the basic questions we have for everyone that comes on the vocast. And starting off really light, what is your favorite or preferred drink? <sighs> Water. <laughs> Water, water, and coffee. Uh, mm. About it, man. I'm a big tea drinker too, but uh, that's about it. Let me ask you, black or um, do you like black coffee? Yeah, Sweet. I just yeah, I just drink it straight, man. No need to complicate it. Sorry, nah, it. I'm right there with you. What's your favorite blend? I'm not picky, man. I'm not picky. It's just uh, it's just the taste, and I, you know, I'm like this with a lot of things. Um, there are probably a handful of things I have a favorite of, but I just appreciate appreciate it all, man. I'm, I'm in the, the same boat. I'll drink it all, but I love me some dark blends. Yeah. I yeah, love me some dark stuff. Yeah. What's your go-to like brand? Like what do you have in the cabinet? Um, honestly, my go-to right now is Seattle's best. And then yeah. there's a, so, there's a, there's a brand of theirs called uh post alley. Okay. It's really smoky. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's my favorite go-to right I'll now. Pick that up. Yeah. <laughs> That's some good stuff. You can get it at any grocery store. I'm familiar with the brand. Let's check it out. I like to switch it up. It's good stuff, man. Let's see. Where's my other one? Okie doke. So this one is going to be diving into the music side a little bit. Okay. So what or who got you into music? Oh, music in general. Wow. Um, <laughs> or yeah. just or just or like just singing in general. Also, either way. Yeah. No, I've always. <clears throat> really enjoyed music i um you know growing up as a kid we always had music around like we had you know, my, my folks old records and whatever else and you know something was always playing and then of course being familiar with um just growing up in church you know in a baptist church got a lot of exposure to gospel and the related kind of genres of, of music there that way myself um, included yeah, you know, it's, it's a good jumping off point, um, especially in the gospel context when there's so much jazz, blues, R&B influence in that. So it really enriches your your palate um, as mm -hmm. a listener and as a performer eventually. But yeah, I mean, you know, in school, I got this is, yeah, I, I enjoy this kind of trajectory conversation. You know, I got into choir, but never really loved it. It was a thing to do, you know, in grade school. Yeah. And, um, you know, going to junior high and I would say that's when, let me back up. I would say junior high is when my trajectory really started as far as me wanting to do and being interested in this stuff as a performer. Yeah. But if I go back to like being a kid and being in the church, um, <laughs> we had a like men's like deacons group right and they would perform on fourth or fifth sundays or something like that right and that was very heavy on like southern gospel and so it's funny i can remember 
being like five, you know, and the guy that they had singing bass in that group was uh, Brother Johnny Tyson, man. He was this skinny little dark skinned dude and you know older and older guy but he was a killer man <laughs> he's a killer and i remember thinking like oh it would be really cool to have a voice like that so it's kind of uh a funny full circle thing that i wound up getting there um yeah but yeah that was a big influence and then you know junior high is when i kind of found barbershop um Ooh, yes. on one of our field trips we went to see forever plaid which i wasn't familiar with and that just that just really was a light bulb moment for me. You know, when I had heard of barbershops, I was the same. It was the same way. I listened to my first barbershop tune and mm -hmm. I was just, I was hooked. Yeah. 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 There's something special hooked. about it, man. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, that was around the same times of, uh, you know, me growing up, I was exposed to, you know, boys, men and all those guys and the kind of group harmony was big uh in that time frame anyway and then i just kind of got deeper and deeper into it as i went mm. on and so my voice changed when i was like 11 12 right so i'm this scrawny you know five foot little dude and it <laughs> it was it was dramatic over like a summer and at first i didn't hear it when you know my folks were like hey your, your voice is changing because i'm with myself every day you don't realize <laughs> the little yeah. minister day-to-day changes and then at a certain point, it was just undeniable, right? <laughs> when, I just, right. when I naturally went to the lower octave. And then when that change happened, it was kind of like, oh, I'm like a Johnny Tyson now. Oh, yeah. I'm like the bass in whatever. I'm like the guy in Temptations. I'm like the guy in yeah. Takes, you know, whatever. So then I, since I kind of carved out my role, I was like, all right, let's see. Let's see what we can do with this thing. For sure, man. How does it feel to go from probably like a tenor or like high berry to basso in like in a in a whole summer bro i went from like male soprano to <laughs> like I, was, I was with the girls man and uh yeah it was really cool because of course i was the only one down there and still <laughs> the only one really really down there uh in any you know context that i find myself in so 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 just to just to give any some other people like some context. So where your where did your voice sit at its lowest prior to puberty? Like know. like I if just, you were to I, guess, I have, I have I literally have no idea because it wasn't like I was passionate about music enough to to really check notice that thing. I just sang, and where they put me was. The Sopranos, <laughs> you know what I mean? so not even close. Like I, I, I haven't been a baritone a day in my life. I don't think. <laughs> so, I mean, I can see that. I mean, you're yeah. literally talking down past an A flat one. So I mean, yeah, it's this is where where it sits. Even though I've trained over the years to like stretch it upwards or whatever. This this is home where I'm speaking. <laughs> yeah, know? for sure. So that has been. So that was back when you were. What was rough rough age again for your for when I mean, it was It was like the summer between seventh and eighth grade, and since I skipped a grade, you know that was eleven or twelve, probably yeah. fresh twelve. Freakish genetics to have a voice drop that far in, and you said just over a summer, like roughly three to four months. Yeah, yeah. Like when I came back from that summer, it was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, no. Elliot is a true freak of nature when it comes to a voice drop. This does not happen all the time. No does not happen all the time so he's really gotten into the music field on the gospel side of things and that is one of the biggest ways a lot of people get into the music field is their exposure to music through the christian faith too so just keep that in mind folks it's not everybody comes from the same like background For and, sure. but they still fall in love with music in the same fashion it's pretty it's pretty awesome, like even across the board, like how people just completely fall in love with music, regardless of where they came from, mm -hmm. is the craziest thing ever. How music ties us all together. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Let's see, next one. Who are some of the most influential figures, both in your life as well as your musical career? Oh gosh, man, that's really tough. That's really tough. I mean, I could list for days when it comes to life. I mean, I feel like <clears throat> you learn, you know, like I said before, I've had a really interesting trajectory professionally and personally. Mm -hmm. And I think everything we experience shapes us in a way, 
right? Even if you're not really aware of how something might impact you in the moment, it all is part of your story and who you become and how you move about life. So yeah. it's hard to really, you know, single out particular experiences or people, but let's see, I can name a few. I mean, so uh, as a person, I think, gosh, everyone in my family, right? Of course, especially my father, right? There's so yeah, much, yeah. If, if you knew him, uh, so much that we have in common or that I kind of even not even try and get from him. Um, mm -hmm. Very similar. And then I think, I mean, gosh, just books and, and videos and things like that. Like I'll pull something. I mean, obviously, like I said, I grew up in the church, so pulled a lot from that and the, the community I had there. Right. But even, I guess I don't like to read a lot. I don't read a lot of fiction. So I, I pull some wisdom from like Tao, Taoist teaching and things like that. And mm -hmm. gosh, it's, it's everything. And I think as far as people, you know, there are people that might've influenced me both personally and professionally um, in just how to be creative, how to be unique, how to be fearless, all those things that are kind of wrapped in who you are as an individual and a performer. Like right. one of my directors, a couple of my directors, Scott Hine, one of my directors in uh, high school, um, Lauren Sager, really all of my voice teachers in some capacity had an impact on me personally and professionally. Bruce Bennett down at Belmont. Um, yeah, it, it, the list goes on and on. But yeah. an easier conversation, I think, is um, is music. So, so I think I've had different phases as a as a listener as far as what I really listen to most and, and pull from. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, when I was really young, I was a big fan of Michael Jackson. Oh, yeah. yeah I liked... Like I said before, all the harmony groups, all your boys to men, your after seven guy, new edition, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Take six, huge. That might be my biggest like vocal acapella, whatever influence and Alvin Shia being a part of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it goes on and on. I'll have a, I had a phase where I listened to a lot of funk music, phase where I listened to a lot of kind of indie, down tempo, weird R and B, just D'Angelo, if you want to talk about like 2000 era soul stuff, it just yeah, it's pieces everywhere, man. I hear you, man, for sure. Yeah, huge, huge influences for sure. Because I think, and here's the thing too, like I like, I think it's important as a professional, really with whatever you do, but especially music, to have your own lane, right? To have your unique thing. That makes you you. I don't believe in copying, um, even though you may be influenced by one thing or two from this or that individual. Yeah. But so I've always taken that approach. And whereas maybe there's not another base who has this bundle of skills, that doesn't mean I'm not going to do that. So right. like, yeah, this, this, this. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, yeah. My approach. Mm -hmm. For sure, man. For sure. And I think like. Sorry to go on at this point, no but worries. I think it's this is one of the things that I appreciate about like the vocal music community is just how there are so many different lanes as far as groups and individuals. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. I appreciate my home free guys. Right. They weren't always in this lane, but they have this country lane and that's where they drive and they crush it. It right? sticks. And you, right. Exactly. It's their thing. And they are killer at it right and i think the same is true with with certain bass vocalists right there are some that are killer at one thing and they just don't do the other stuff and that's fine yeah right? like if you were to compare me to like uh eric holloway yeah who's another just killer super low bass yeah he's not really the guy to do r&b runs and a lot of you know that kind of more poppy stuff right but that's cool because he has this thing and he's mountain of a voice right? yeah you know I mean? there's everybody. no other way to describe it yeah so it's just you know everybody has their own their own thing yeah and it, it, it works out too when you've got people that are just that talented they can they can absolutely smash their niche yeah it's oh, just yeah. it's crazy yeah yeah i love that let's see what's the next one all right, so let's see. What is something that one of those influential figures that you mentioned has said to you that stuck with you your entire 
life journey. <laughs> it could be music related, non music related. Yeah, you know. <clears throat> And this is not even the person that I mentioned or someone I would necessarily because we're kind of in the same generation, if you will. Yeah. But I do like one thing that's really neat about musicians is having a unique maybe lens through which you enjoy and experience and consume music. Because mm. a lot of people who maybe don't have a lot of musical ability um, can enjoy songs or enjoy a vocalist or whatever but i feel like if you're you play that same instrument or you do that play that same role you listen to it in a different way you appreciate it in a different way and i remember there was one gig <laughs> one gig this is probably t it was 10 years ago actually a little more than 10 years ago where um i was filling in for a home free thing and it was like half the guys, it was around the holidays, like just after Christmas. Yeah. Half the guys didn't want to do it. And this was before they were singing off home free. It was like, I think like three months before they auditioned for the show. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so half the guys didn't want to do it. Half the guys were like, this is a cruise. I mean, it's paid vacation. Let's do this thing. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was Chris, Austin, Tim, me, and a guy named Marty, Marty, who, um, does VP and stuff with a group called Blue Trooper, who okay. both Tim and I had worked with in the past. But anyway, so it was this weird amalgamation of, of people, right, that you wouldn't expect to, to be together. But, you know, Tim and I had a good conversation there, too. And we had, you know, been familiar with each other until four or five years prior to that. But um, that might have been the first time we actually connected in person. And we were appreciating, like, Paul David Kinnamer. Yes. And, like, at both being bass singers, we could really, like, Appreciate it. And not just the low notes are cool, but his flexibility in his solos, right? That's something that not a lot of basses do that I think Tim and I both really appreciate. Yeah. And both really just got to kind of geek out on that. And one thing about Paul that I had heard prior to that, and Tim was aware of too, I'm sure you can just tell Paul the influence of Tim's yeah. um, as well. But um, I don't know where I saw it, but like PDK would practice soloing um you know an octave or two beneath pop singers so he's in his range right his comfortable range right but doing all the tricks that like you know a mariah carey or brian mcknight or whatever you know wanye more yeah. from the men might do and you know i was real big as far as like the a soulful texture of the voice and that style but really taking it to that extreme of just like mastering the dexterity and, and the expression and the freedom um, of the voice a tim and i really shared an appreciation in that and i think that shows in our music that's something i'll never stop doing yeah i can i can definitely see the inspiration for pdk in there yeah yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. he's a, he's he's one of the greats man i'll tell you yeah yeah and he's another one who has his own unique thing he does right? i mean this is 20 years ago when valor was doing all their stuff i mean probably even longer but not, not many other bases for doing a lot of, you know, flexible runs and the low stuff. Yeah. And and what makes PDK even better is that he's a master of chest fry. Yeah. Yeah. It's different, man. It's um, uh, that's another thing where everybody has their own approach to stuff. And I've got my feelings about, you know, extended techniques, but his is very clean. Like it's freaking very clean that's yeah. and that's what confuses a lot of people about him they're they're like oh he's super low no he's just got a really 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 good chest fry yeah exactly I mean, exactly he does have a good lower extension but his chest yeah, fry I mean, is super clean the the fry is what makes him a standout like if it weren't for that he would just be a cool voice a cool bass voice but definitely yeah definitely yeah. man he's awesome mm -hmm. all right let's see so for those that don't know, do you play any instruments? And if so, what are they? Not well. <laughs> you know, I um you know, I started taking piano in like sixth grade, took it all the way up through high school and had to um got to and had to for my music minor, which eventually became a music major. Um but didn't really do much with it after that, right? Just enough to write songs when I need or, you know, plunk out parts and stuff when I'm arranging. Yeah. And then um, maybe 10 years ago, I bought myself an electric bass and kind of 
for a long time there was teaching myself, you know, play. And so I still have the child, so I don't have as much time to pick it up as much as I, as I used to. But that's really about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I hear you. Yeah. Just a little bit of bass and you planked, or planked around on some others. Yeah, bass and piano. I think I'm probably better at the bass than I am on the piano at this point. I just never, never really play. Well, um, it, ma- it matches your voice, so it's only a problem. Yeah, it's, it's, it translates. You know, I speak <laughs> the language. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you said you, how long have you, been, have you been playing these two for on and off? For you yeah, know, let's see if it was six period. And so, I mean, that would have been about 97. I probably started lessons. That was only for, call it five, 10 years. And then bass, 10 ish, but I would say five. I've even taken it remotely seriously. Been super busy lately, but yeah. it's still there. And we still, you know, I still pick it up every now and again. Yeah. And I'm the same way with my instruments. I mean, I, I pick yeah. around with them. What do you play? So I play, I pick around on the guitar. I played mm-hmm. uh, trombone throughout middle nice, school and man. high school. Nice. I still that, play it on occasion. Okay. That's one thing I wish I, um, if I could do life over again, I would probably pick up a brass instrument also. Like, I just feel like I didn't really have a lot of exposure to instrumental music that inspired me growing up. Mm-hmm. And later on, in life as a young adult or whatever, getting you know, exposed to a lot more. It's like, ah, oh, damn, I wish, I wish I knew how to play. You know, so we can geek on that angle for a second. Yeah, yeah. Um, are you familiar with Young Blood Brass Band? This, I'm like a evangelist for Young Blood Brass Band. <laughs> I know don't them? know that I've actually heard of them. Listen to them, it'll change your life. They, um, they kind of blend. Oh, kind of like. You know, New Orleans ish. I don't know. I wouldn't put them in that vein, but brass band. But if you think infused with a lot of hip hop and rock and some jazz influence there too, Ooh. and it's worth the price of admission just to hear their uh, sousaphone player. Right? It's not a sexy instrument. Right? It's normally mm-hmm. it's some bumbling, you know, goofball out there doing the thing. But yeah, uh, this guy, he basically, if you listen to either Mad World, all right, or an original called Brooklyn. Listen to Brooklyn. He'll play and sing and sometimes even kind of beatbox all at once. <laughs> it's madness. It's mad. So he's like playing the fundamental, singing the fifth or like a sixth or whatever works with a harmony and then doing some rhythmic stuff. It, it's it's crazy. Taking so, yeah. the taking the phrase mad world to a new level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for real. <laughs> I'm definitely going to have to check this out on yeah, my off time. Me. I love me some good brass stuff. I like, yeah. I've always liked, I have a guilty pleasure in like big band stuff and okay. like, yeah, and like yeah. brass. So I definitely mm-hmm. am going to have to do that. Yeah. He'll do it. That is awesome. So what are some things that people may not know about you being that like, so you have your internet music life. So what are some people, some things that people may not know about you coming from that angle? Like with that life that you have online and then through your music what some people may not know. Bro, um, I'm a fairly I'm a fairly private dude online, right? So there's <laughs> there's a ton of stuff people might not know. Um, I don't know. I'll throw out some fun facts, but if there's any other, you know, more more specificity or an area you want to delve into, get into it. But like, I don't know, man. Uh, I'm here in Texas, but I'm I'm from this tiny little town in Illinois. Right? I'm literally like a, a cornfield kid. Sure My first enough. job was actually detasseling corn. Like I, yeah little ag town agricultural town oh yeah and um you know what else let's see my wife is is german a real born and raised german we actually met through my touring with the house jacks so oh, wow. that's kind of a neat a neat thing um yeah man and like i said i just I, i'll find i guess people hear the finished product of anything that i release right but um a lot of what's made me into the singer that i am and how I go about music and what I like to do is just built on listening to everything. Like I'll literally listen to and appreciate just about everything. I don't do a whole lot of super country country or super poppy pop. Yeah. And everything else is fair game. I think it contributes, you know, to just your musical mind. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I find myself in the same boat too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I listen so to literally stuff everything. Yeah. Literally everything. Yeah. For sure. You know, and thank goodness for like, you know, Spotify, you'll accidentally traipse into something you didn't even know about. You know what I mean? That wasn't, you know, 20 years ago, you went to Sam Goody or whatever and got the CD you were looking for and that's what you yeah. got. 
I feel like nowadays the universe of music is so vast and accessible and easy to hop over from one pond to the next that you can't help but uh you know pick up some new stuff and those ponds that you can jump from one to the other can be much deeper than you originally anticipated oh for sure for sure it's pretty amazing how accessible just like i guess you could say quote unquote underground music is right i mean myself included (laughs) (laughs) you know i'm not in a i don't really heavily the tour or anything anymore i'm not in a group i just kind of i'm a dude that just makes stuff sometimes and somehow folks have found me and appreciated it you know so it's cool that the gates are kind of blown open you know it's truly cool too i mean technology has its ups and its downs but i will say one of the ups in the music industry for sure is the ability to expose yourself to all kinds of all manners of music now oh yeah absolutely absolutely so so what are some things that you do in your off time when you're not when you're not doing your full time job? You're not recording music, et cetera. Man, off time is a funny concept. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny concept. Um, yeah, nowadays, man, my job is pretty demanding. So I, you know, I spend a good chunk of hours there. Um, for those who don't know, I guess I'm a fairly new dad. Also, I've got a Gosh, 11 month old as of today. Um, so <laughs> that's my sweetheart. So we, you know, that's a lot of my time, of course, naturally too. Music when I can get to it or when I have, you know, an idea and can carve out time, which is fairly rare. And then my other, I would say, passion on equal footing with music is is weightlifting, you know, is, is fitness. So yeah. and most of it is centered around powerlifting esque you know, powerlifting, power building, some strong man conditioning. That's, I've been about that for a long time too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I see you. I see you. Yeah. Those are my things. I'm in a, I'm in the fitness boat myself. Yeah. What's your, uh, you a CrossFit guy? Are you, uh, what's your thing? Well, in the moment I'm work right now I'm working on a cut, but okay. um, I'm trying to go for the aesthetic look, but I, I do yeah. have a fitness world. I have a guilty pleasure for uh, deadlifting. Yeah, same here, man. Let's go. I have a guilty, I have a guilty pleasure in deadlifting, man. Yeah, same. same. I recently, I recently pulled a one rep max of um, two eighty five the other day, which for me is okay. huge because coming from just not even a full year ago, not knowing how to deadlift properly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And I, I remember my max was like one eighty five back then because I wasn't doing it right. I remember those days too. <laughs> and I was, I had finally gotten my form right. Cause there's, there's this guy at my local gym and he's the one mm-hmm. that I can attribute my proper form and everything to his name is Larry. Yeah. Dude is probably like five foot, like six, like he's kind of short, yeah. but he is probably every bit of 200, 200, like two, between 200 and 230, 230 pounds of muscle. Dude is so a literal he, refrigerator of a human. Yeah, he's literally like he's yeah. he's a freakish brute, and he's he's one of those people that can just pull six pretty much six hundred pounds no problem. And That's impressive. I mean, I will say it's shorter range of motion, but still, anybody pulling six is <laughs> pretty solid, man. Different. Yeah, but I remember I remember he was one of the people that I can attribute to getting this most recent PR because yeah. I the reason so she his wife also she works there and she has a friend that they work out with over there and Mm -hmm. we all know each other so i'm talking to him one day i'm just shooting the crap you know i'm I'm working chest that day and i'm like okay i got to talking about deadlift and he's like you know you know this he's pointing to his wife's friend he's like you know you know she does 280 right and i'm like I would, I, that, yourself, that, huh? that 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 made me a little mad and she was and and she was she's your typical she's your typical build female you know yeah and, yeah mm-hmm. yeah 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 exactly and i was like okay now that made me mad so i went and i i shot down an extra scoop of pre-workout waited 10 yeah. minutes i went to the deadlift bar and i'm i'm out at five more pounds and i was like i've never even thought about going this far but yeah I threw on uh, a, a random Avenged Sevenfold song. I yeah, put my okay. headset headset on, and I was like, "Okay, As, um, I'm going." And I jumped into it. I I completely my mind went blank. I, I started mm-hmm. to pull, and then I just 
I completely zoned out and I was just yeah, staring yeah. myself in the mirror and I pulled it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, much is mental, man. I think, uh, it's that way with lifting. It's that way. I mean, in life, even in singing sometimes. Right. But yeah, I've, I've found that out the hard way in music, man. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Imposter I mean, syndrome is very real. Oh yeah. Yeah. You gotta be in the right like frame of mind, but yeah, there's nothing like those PR days, man. So you're going for gun for three fifteen here soon. I'm going to go for three plates soon, man. I'm going to try. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It might be hard going into my cut, but we'll see. That's valid. You'll have to, like, modulate your volume a little bit and stuff. But, uh, yeah, man, I, you know, it's, you set those little milestones and they seem big when you're shooting up at them. But yeah. then once you're passing this, like, three plates, four plates, like, it's just <laughs> like, a funny thing, you know. I was like, I bet I could do this in a, in a couple of months. And, you know, you start planning out like some pretty ambitious goals. Once you hit the one you just were mm -hmm. aiming for, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. And there's a mental block I feel too, around the big plates, right? Like, I feel like it's like, you're staring at it and it's like, okay, I hit 285, three, three whole plates on it. You know, and I had that when I was going to 315, I had that when I was going to 405. Yeah. I, I've never pulled more than 505. That's kind of my max at present. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on test max very often, but like, there's that block and even now i'm like getting past 505 which i don't try often in my mind it's like, sheesh, like 545 now to me it's like <clears throat> can't imagine it right yeah definitely dude you know? it's crazy how that works yeah 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 how tall are you so how i am 511 okay so about so. okay yeah. yeah i mean like it's it's interesting how different builds lend themselves to different lifts you know what yeah. I mean? So I feel like a guy like you, and that's probably why we both appreciate the deadlift, like having longer arms. Like that's just my build too. Like I'm just long built. Um, yeah. Gives you an advantage, even if you are, you know, slightly taller than some folks. Whereas bench for guys like us is probably a little bit more of a, an undertaker it, because there's a range of motion that's still ridiculous. It, it can, you know? it can be difficult. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. I'm, I'm, I'm on the road to one plate for, for, uh, for chest. Yeah. For, uh, for bench Think press. It. That'll be, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That'll now, be nothing I, a year from now. Incline is something I'm good at, but. Yeah, I love incline. For sure. Yeah. Oh, man. What a what a fitness uh, rabbit. Yeah, a little there. detour. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love it, man. Yeah. So, um, how often do you practice uh, singing or music throughout the week? So, I know you said that time is a precious commodity in your in your world yeah man um i'll be honest with you nowadays and even when i was you know touring and whatnot professionally and regularly i never practiced all that often and i think it's because my approach to practice is just different um and i'm and, intrigued yeah well here it, it's because of this because I, I would never say practice is not important right um i think it's more of just that um having done it for so long right it's like, like can, second nature maybe I, yeah i can be a lot more free with how often and, and what i call practice because i had such a strong foundation of doing music kind of informally without training you mm -hmm. know in high school especially and then having that training in college mm -hmm. uh, both classically and commercially non-classical music Right. And then, you know, so like even before I stepped foot on the stage as a professional, I was practicing quite regularly as an ensemble singer, classically as an ensemble singer with vocal jazz or whatever else, and as a soloist. So, you know, it was well ingrained as far as the proper way to approach whatever, right, style or the production of tone or the whatever else. And so, you know, I think through the years, it's been more of, I can't tell you the last time I sang a scale, right? Or anything of the fundamental type <laughs> stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if I'm warming up for a show, it's not, it's nothing like that for me. Um, yeah. I haven't done it for this long. But, you know, through the last, I'll say decade plus, it's been more of singing along with things in different capacities. Yeah. So one of the things that I did a lot in college, shout out to my old voice, voice teacher, who was really the perfect teacher for me because we had fairly similar voices. It wasn't quite as low, but he had a freakish range and, and some nice lows too. Yeah. Um, but he would put, just to kind of free up my upper register, we would take songs that were in an okay key, but 
I don't know, like to me at that time, felt kind of high for me. Um, and he would put it in even a slightly higher key, mm-hmm. right? To kind of like force me to think about navigating those transitions and spaces in my voice, right? Yeah, so that yeah, yeah. Bring down to the initial key that we were at, it kind of just clicks together because you spent more time there, right? Yeah. So spending time in the places that are um, less comfortable or less further away from home, let's say, okay? Yeah. Further yeah. away from home. Um, and that's contributed to me being the singer I am today. And then I think spending time taking songs that you appreciate and doing something different with it, whether it be, like I said, shout out to Pete K, taking things down a couple few octaves and getting comfortable doing the tricks around a low B or run that ends on a G, like just absurd things there. Right. Or singing harmonies with really weird melodies that just gets your brain to think and woodshed in that way. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot more of that. And, you know, that's more of in the shower or when I'm driving or if I'm, um, just hanging around the house or out the gym. Um, <laughs> so when COVID hit and everybody was clamoring for toilet paper and, and eggs and beans and whatever, you know, <laughs> I got those two, I guess, and, and got my survival stats of everything. But right. I also um, went and bought up a ton of, like had a rack put in my garage, got a ton of weights and everything. So yeah, probably half of my workouts are literally out in the garage doing real powerlifting stuff. But in between sets, I'm, you know, messing around with musical ideas and, whatever so just in the gaps of life when i can and that that tends to be enough these days because yeah, yeah. there's such a foundation there you know that seems to be a trend too i've noticed with a lot of the people i've talked to on here mm-hmm. they tend to do a lot of um work on the go if if you will yeah yeah you gotta you gotta keep the chop sharp and keep your keep your mind sharp you know what i mean as far as your creativity and how you approach things so yeah definitely definitely so uh, what does, so I know you that don't really have much of a warm up routine, but um, if you have like a go-to warm up routine, like say you were getting ready to go sing with one of your groups 10, 15 years ago, what would be one of your warm up routines look like? What, what would one of them look like? If you remember. Oh, I remember. Um, it's just, again, I'm not putting this out there as like a encouragement to be this way. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'll tell you, man, if I'm singing, so like if I'm recording something, for example, (laughs) it'll normally consist of like just some light sirens to start, right? Just to kind of warm things up. Right. Um, And then gradually kind of getting higher to one of the highs. And, you know, just again, singing around with, you know, put like I actually have a playlist on Spotify of things that I like to, sing lead to or like if i'm you know do on a long drive i'll yeah. sing to and, and mess around and, and do some ideas because it just kind of warms up my, my voice and my mind so yeah. that's it's kind of more of that but really mostly sirens light singing and then you know wandering into the range that i'll that i'll be performing yeah, that's what, yeah. but if i'm singing bass man if i'm recording something for bass my routine is literally wake up they're on a robe or something <laughs> <laughs> pants Come yeah. here and do it because you know rolling out of bed is when those you know d's and e's and stuff are really are at their at their best and most recordable for sure so yeah it I'm, depends out of curiosity i will have a quick detour so what does your recording setup look like if you were to go record something right now it's very skeletal like i'm not a gadget gizmo man even my like i'm just not even a pro tools guy like it's very i never spent the time to become a whiz at all that just because a i just wasn't my focus in school yeah b it i don't know never became that necessary i wish i had the time to do it now um and then c i feel like i have a what's the word i want to say i am i get kind of miffed at how so like technology is like you were saying before, um, and maybe this was before the call we were having that conversation, but technology is has its ups and downs and its pros and cons, right? Yeah. And yeah. with as great, with, with as thankful I am that there is, has been advan- uh, advancements in technology to make it so that I can, you know, have a little setup in my office, right? And knock out some stuff easily. Right. I do feel like a lot of people 
bass singers for sure, um, but not limited to bass singers, over rely on technology. Right. Like that's that's a good that's a good vo- view. That, that's a good. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you hear these guys. I don't know. Like I, people could sound very different live in person without the bells and whistles versus mm-hmm. what you hear in the finished product. Right. And I think I've just you know really wanted to take a more just honest approach. Right. I don't. I never want to over rely on technology or. That's fair. Yeah. I have to do all that to put out an impressive product. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I, yeah. So to your question, though, I mean, I got my road here uh, to my side. What is it? The whatever it is, NT1A or whatever it is. That's kind of been my go to here for the last. We had this maybe about five years. My little Scarlet 2x2 two two, uh, Pro Tools. I don't even know what version it is. Fairly recent version. I had to upgrade last year. Yeah. But man, that's really about it. Pretty it solid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The how essentials. do you how do you do your soundproofing? Do you uh, do any? Dude, nothing, nothing too special. I've got some panels around here. I've got, uh, you know, my mic is kind of has the uh, screen on the back or whatever. But yeah, that's really about it. I mean, I'm not doing a whole lot of like super belty crazy stuff where it's going to be slapping around. So you know, yeah. it doesn't take a whole lot. Yeah, and plus, like at the end of the day, even just a few panels here and there, the I mean, yeah. the frequencies are just get trapped in those panels. With yeah, how exactly. low they are, anyway. Yeah, you know, a little bit goes a long way, I think, to make a decent quality recording. Yeah, I agree. Let's see. So, moving on to more range-related questions. Yeah. So, for those that don't know, what are your, some of your record high and record lows in chest voice? Yeah, um, that I've recorded or that I've ever done. Any, either one, either one. Yeah. Um, that I've recorded, let me think, that I've recorded, there's a C, a low, a double low C in that Grinch thing that I put out last year. Yes, there is. I remember that. Yeah. So that's, that's the lowest I've recorded. Um, the highest I've recorded is actually in that same song. There's a B5 in that also. Yes. So recorded, I think that's, that's the extremes. As far as that I've done, and I guess you asked chest voice, what do you think? what that answer would be too. Um, and that's a funny question too, because I think depending on who you ask, you know, I've heard people talk about this is chess, this is, you know, on either low or high end, this is chess, this isn't, this is mix, whatever. Yeah. It gets, it gets tricky, especially up high to really be honest about that. Um, or to know as a listener, if you're not trained, um, true chest, you know, I, there was a song I did in the house jacks that had me up at, it was my yeah a flat four i've done live a live a four is probably the highest i've gone and then i've recorded when you wish upon a star i think has there's been some like b's and b flats up there and okay. I've, I've mixed up to maybe a c sharp i think and that was was chest mix so mm-hmm. that's about it and then lowest that i've lowest and highest that i've ever produced to my knowledge um there's a b flat zero and i will say i was under the weather uh literally only saying that note once in my life i think and it was a a, a mistake from that the session on the grinch <laughs> <laughs> because i was i knew that c was going to be in there so i had like you know after the track was over i just like hit chord had the click going and just sang that note over and over again so i could pick the best one the one that i like the best yeah and i just kind of like over relaxed on one so when i was listening back to it i was like wait <laughs> <laughs> you know so there was that and then by the same token um i had to do the same thing with that that d5 because that's definitely a note that's uh not in my typical everyday range yeah. so i had to take several passes at that um and there was one that i overshot when it was a C sharp six. So as far as the lowest and highs I've ever produced, that's, that's it. Yeah. Guys, if you are not familiar with how, like if you, if it doesn't register how crazy this range actually is. (laughs) So the man, something I can't even produce any notes in the sixth octave without, without sounding like, or without sounding like I'm squealing. So in, in a whistle range, <laughs> whistle tones. It's, it's up there, man. That's, and that's wild to me. For those that don't know, if you have not heard my short cover with, 
uh, Fernie on um, Believer. I end that short cover with a B flat zero, but but I have to use an extended technique for that. This man did it with his full chest voice. It was a hot day, man. <laughs> he he did it with his chest voice, and there are you can probably count on one hand the amount of humans that have ever produced that kind of note in full chest in full true chest. Yeah, I'm sure that's that's one hand. Now that's not a note I have every day, but you know, I'll every once in a while I have those C's and B's and whatnot. So it's it's pretty crazy, folks. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun for me. Yeah, it's I, I'm sure it is being a being <laughs> one of those genetic outliers that yeah, can just absolutely. do that. Never would have guessed, you know. Definitely, man. Be gifted with that, but yeah, it's cool. So. Where does your voice sit right now? What's your like? As about about how low could you go realistically right now? Out of curiosity, man, I would say like, and this is always a funky question because I think people will answer it differently. Yeah, most people will answer it and give you notes that sound like absolute dog crap, <laughs> right? Like because, right. <laughs> because everybody wants to puff themselves up or whatever, right? That's why I like always take care to be super like honest and transparent. Yeah, I've sung a B and B flat before. That's not something I'm walking around doing on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, as far as like, you know, it depends on time of day. It depends on a lot of things. It right. On I've spoken that day or whatever. Um, but I would say like, look, I mean, if I'm just hanging around through the day, it probably wouldn't be too much of a an undertaking for me to have like F F sharp on the bottom and F F, F sharp up top. I would say that's probably like my walk around, whatever. And if I'm doing a show, I can count on like an evening show after all day talking and warming up and losing my morning lows and whatever. Yeah. I would say probably F sharp to F sharp is like my money. Like F sharp one, no problem. F sharp four in chess, no problem. F sharp five and false no problem. On a yeah. controlled environment, I could probably extend that a little bit, but like if I can say I'm gonna show up at the gig and hit these notes, yeah, at it, 7 p.m. after a day of doing everything. Yeah. Solid, man. And like yeah. I said, folks, to have this kind of range as a basso is just ridiculous. And when I say basso, yeah. that's that's that is an Italian word for basso profundo, which means profound bass, which is the lowest voice class in the world, FYI. He's definitely in that class, and he's just got a comfortable range up in the third and fourth octaves that is just usually unheard of in most bass voices, much less a basso. Yeah, so. I appreciate it, man. I think, you know, and I think it's because I took a, a, a strange path, right? Because... I mean, a lot of time, like you said, basses, especially truly, you know, the real bassos are yeah. really rare. So if you have the lows and they're of good quality, you're going to get gigs. Right. As long as you're not a jerk and you, you know, have a decent work ethic. <laughs> right. Like right. you're going to get gigs and you understand music. Um, so I think, A, not a lot of super low basses, of which there are not a lot. Um feel an urge to even go beyond that which is fine yeah because you can be very great with just that but you know for some reason um when i transferred to belmont saturday illinois state and then transferred to belmont university of nashville it was a lot more emphasis on your solo skills and style in a commercial context you know there aren't many schools that have a commercial music degree so i was really fortunate to have that and to be able to for those two years really really flex those muscles and really focus on like even in that time i kind of put singing bass on a back burner and yeah. just focused on being a soloist and that's just paid dividends you know more and more over the years as i've experimented and heard new things and, and tried new things definitely man and for those that don't know it is definitely as you can see with him it's possible to have a good higher extension but you really have to work for it if you're a bass you singer. You because do. Your voice will naturally sit lower and yeah. it'll be more difficult for you to train that higher register. But once you get there, once you've worked it for a good while and you're comfortable, then you can be a bass with a with a higher extension. Easily. 100%. And I think, man, falsetto, I feel like a lot of basses, I don't know what it is, have a real decent falsetto. 
So you can, even if you don't have a good chest voice right now, you can develop that falsetto. My mm -hmm. falsettos come light years from even when I was, you know, 15 years ago when I was doing home free stuff regularly. Um, and even 10 years ago, like you just work at it, work at it and it's going to get there. Definitely. Same with that. And I feel like, man, I'll shout out like David Kahn is one example, right? Where, you know, I wouldn't put him in a profundo spot necessarily, but like naturally, you know, he, he's not a tenor. Right. right. <laughs> um, and I, I don't, I wouldn't say he's a baritone either. Right. Um, but he's one, you know, David hit me up way early on in his <clears throat> kind of trajectory, maybe eight, nine years ago and didn't have a lot of the, you know, higher stuff he's doing right now and is, is good at. Right. Um, but he's one, I feel like people hear me as the finished product, right? I'm 36 <laughs> as of last week. You know, most people have found me on the internet within the last five, maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. And they hear post 10 years of pro work or five or whatever it is, right? Yeah. I think David's one example where a lot of people have gotten the chance to see him develop. And he's one that I would definitely applaud and count out for putting in and call out for putting in the work. You yeah. know what I mean? Not a lot of people want to put in the work to get from where they are naturally to a, a much uh, fuller skill bag. Right. You know, I, I wish more people would. I wish more people would. Definitely. Definitely. It's pretty crazy, man. Especially the, ima the amount of work you put in ref reflects your success. 100%. 100%. Definitely. Yeah. <sighs> Let's see. So um, who are some of your personal favorite artists that you've collaborated with throughout the years? Man, um, that's another one. Every every single situation is 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 different and kind of unique and fun in its own way. Obviously, the Pitch Perfect thing was super cool, right? Yeah. Um, can't deny that. I mean, from every angle, because yes, the scale of it's great, but I don't, you know, I don't really care about renown or scale that much. Um, the money was <laughs> great too, even though it's never been my focus. But I mean, the arrangements were super cool, right? You don't hear a lot of like super intense techno hip hop acapella. Like, that was a unique thing. Yeah. Kind of superhuman, whatever. So sonically, yeah. it was very cool. Um, I had already worked with some of the behind the scenes people like Deke and Ed before. Um, but cool to just work in a different context. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Axiom, I, I mean, even though I was kind of just by labor of love on the side, a lot of fun too, because that's that was kind of like my, my brainchild. Yeah. You know, um, Ryan and I had worked together back in 2008. He is the, uh, you know, my tenor. And we kind of kicked around this idea of like, you know, we appreciated Take Six and Boys to Men, you know, these other groups. And, you know, acapella had its place and it's fun or whatever. Um, this was before acapella's like ascension to being prominent in the right. early 2010s. But um, we were kind of like, you know, it'd be kind of fun and, and funny to have a group that was, yeah, acapella, but more that could step outside of the typical bounds of acapella, like a group that could, and this is literally one of the things we tossed around, a group that could honestly, authentically, and convincingly perform punk. <laughs> like that was literally one of the early conversations, just because a lot of groups, man, are just a little, uh, you know, they start out from being goofy choir kids. <laughs> And, you know, they might not have a lot of stylings in, you know, R&B or mm -hmm. swagger enough to even attempt certain songs. Like, I've right. heard there was a pony that are trash <laughs> from <laughs> acapella groups. And, you know, so I think, um, so I, acting was always fun to me to just be able to flip songs in a new, or A, do songs that other groups might not be able to do, flip songs in a new way like we did with, you know, Fine China or, you know, whatever else. Um, yeah. and, but everything's fun, man. Like the straight up and down I did with Chris and those guys, uh, really fun. The Maroon 5 medley that I helped arrange really fun. And Mad World was fun in a different way. Like it's just, it's just, it's a fun experience. You know, it's like going to new shops or bars or restaurants, you know what I yeah. mean? Everyone has its, uh, appeal. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, so um, got a couple, or I think like four more, and then yeah. we'll migrate to this uh, 
section where you'll get to self-promote. So this one is, do you have any tips, tricks, or life hacks for anyone that currently sings, wants to sing, or is trying to make a career out of singing? Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say learn the fundamentals. I would say that. Maybe that's one thing that I would harp on first. Just because... A, the fundamental. You can't you can't skip the foundational stuff with anything that you do, right? You know you can't skip the foundational stuff for anything you're trying. Any skill you're trying to learn, any whatever it is, right? Like you can't say I'm a lawyer too. You can't skip law school and then <laughs> become whatever. Right. Learn the foundations, and I and I say that first because we're in a at the risk of sounding like old. <laughs> we're in a in a society and where perfection or the appearance of perfection is all around us mm -hmm. right and so i i feel like especially for you know we could say teens and young adults or whatever there's a pressure to be perfect right mm -hmm. yeah. when a the person you're looking at or listening to is probably not as perfect as they seem b when you see or hear that final product you're not hearing and seeing the years and the trenches that went into that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think um, I, I, I don't want anyone to ever underscore the importance of the fundamentals, right? Because that's, that's your springboard. Here. The springboard to um, being great. So that's number one. B, I would say um, expand your horizons, right? If you think, if what really got you in the game for music or whatever else is um, a certain singer or a certain style, don't let that limit you. Right. right? Yeah. So even if I'm a bass singer, listen to tenors. Even if I'm a jazz singer, listen to blues and rock or whatever. Right. So yeah. expand your horizons. Get a good teacher. I mean, I didn't. I was singing for a few years before I went to college and had a voice teacher. Um, so I think. You know, you can make progress by yourself, but when you have somebody who's been through it and knows the fundamentals or knows the business or knows the pedagogy or whatever, yeah. they're going to help you get uh, further, faster. So I'll say those are the maybe the three biggest things that I would say. Yeah. And he's preaching to me, too, because, like I said, I, this was one of those questions that I, I just kind of threw in there kind of for my own knowledge as well, in addition to yeah. everyone else that's listening that wants to sing, because I'm... I wouldn't say I'm a new singer per se, but I'm recently been training a lot more and doing a lot more of my own singing and experimentation. So yeah, yeah. definitely useful information for me. Yeah. And the, actually one other thing, because I, one of the last gigs that I did pre COVID, somebody asked that question too. I'm trying to think what I said. Um, like I touched on this before, but having a thing that makes you, you right. Like having a unique selling point where you are the guy that does, x yeah yeah better than anybody else if you could make it that way so i think you know as far as it being a having a career in music or really doing something with it too i would say like be be good be visible right how are people gonna find you if you don't have stuff out there and then be unique i think that that's the big three as far as taking it to that next level yeah for sure i know i'm definitely still trying to find my niche in the music industry in my own yeah. music but yeah. I'm 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 making some headway. I'm making some headway yeah. for sure. I mean, as long as you're being you, there's your niche. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Let's see. So, for any groups that you've worked with in the past, what is one of the funniest memories you have from working with any of those groups? Man, there's some I can't even say. But let me think through the through any the... any that are PG thirteen. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, oh my goodness. You know, yeah, I'll say one. So this was probably, uh, I'm going to guess 2011, 2012, because I would have still been in Minnesota and was doing stuff with the Home Free guys. And we, because there was a period where Home Free was kind of rotating basis between, you know, me, Tim, and uh, a guy named Troy Horn, okay. who is a, like, last generation acapella hero too he's a, he's a beast he's kind of like tim without the growling stuff just crazy range crazy style whatever mm -hmm. um 
but yeah, with, with, you know, whoever had time home free, wasn't full time. We all had stuff going on too. Yeah. But we, um, we were somewhere, I'm sure somewhere in the middle of the Midwest somewhere and, uh, on tour and we went out to some sushi spot <laughs> and I had told, um, and Adam had never had wasabi before. Oh my goodness. Never had wasabi before. <laughs> so, like, man, I don't know. With a lot of groups, like, you you spend time with these folks and they become like family to you, right? Like, Axiom is like brothers and sisters to me. Home free to this day, still like brothers to me. And it's the same with any group that I've worked with for any period of time. Yeah. But so, you know, <laughs> we're at this restaurant and um, I'm trying to think how I even, I, you know, I, I'm a fairly serious dude in demeanor, but I, I do play around entirely too much so <laughs> uh anybody that knows me will, will tell you that but i um so i'm trying to think so i told him like you know you got to try because i i do you know use the and put wasabi on my stuff and the ginger and a little bit of it makes soy sauce a little bit okay but yeah you know and i it said to him i was he said he had never tried it and i was like oh yeah you gotta try it it definitely you know it adds a kick to it but it's you know <laughs> like it's subtle though like what you gotta like you're gonna you know you, know, you need to put whatever like if you're you need to yeah like it, it, you know you're not it takes a lot to get much out of it right and you know dead dead man dead dead ass serious and so he loads loads this thing up with wasabi right loads and like and meanwhile meanwhile like rob is literally about to die from not like trying to hold the laughter in on the other side of that. and like and this might have even been way back. I think this was before Austin, so it would have been Matt Atwood. Um, but anyway, loads it up, tries it, and immediately is like beet red, like sweating. <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably that's probably one of my favorite memories. Oh my gosh. I mean, but every every group I've worked with, there's countless just really really funny things so that's one that, that still sticks with me if i Sorry, am ever if if i'm ever t- able to get adam on here i'm going to have to ask him about you gotta that. ask if he remembers man yeah we i catch up with those guys every now and again um when they come to town like back in december they came to town for a couple of shows and i caught up with them but i haven't mentioned that to him in a while so i wonder oh if he gosh. yeah 10 years ago i mean it looked like just the pain he was going through visibly <laughs> I would be surprised if you didn't remember it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Adam, you got to tell me about this, dude. You got to tell me about this. Gosh, man, that is hilarious. Yeah. Good like me having tried wasabi before, I knew when you started telling me this story that it was going to be absolutely amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It changed his life. I don't oh. think he probably didn't have the stuff he knows for you know seven years after that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Changed his life for the better. He learned oh, that he yeah. does not oh, like yeah. wasabi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. All right. So just a couple more and then we're gonna do a quick like intermission. So what are your thoughts on extended techniques? I know you mentioned you have your own set of beliefs on them. So what are your thoughts on them? That's a great question. I don't think anybody's like directly asked me that before um not a fan not a fan um okay i mean i'll say this like just the way i think and go about life i'll never i'll never fully knock a person taking the time to master something okay so even if i don't love it you know if you become a person who can flip into this other thing on a dime because you, you know, did put in the man hours to master it. Right. I'm all for, I'm all for the mastery. I'm all for, you know, skill acquisition and really taking your craft seriously. Um, that being said though, I I'm, I'm against these extra techniques for a couple of reasons. Okay. Um, a, and I would feel this way, even if I weren't a bass singer, obviously like I just put music out sometimes. So I'm not really trying to, I don't have an endeavor to be this, figure or anything that's fair um you know so but but i do feel like objectively it kind of cheapens the specialness of a true base okay okay i see right because if you think about like if you think about it with uh um, growl or fire whatever you want to call it 
mm. or subharmonics or chest fry or whatever um which if there's fry in it it's fry in my mind but anyway um right right an e1 is nothing in those techniques right it's just it's not special with with growl or um subharmonic especially subharmonic you're singing an e and you're doing this thing that cuts the fundamental in half and people hear an e1 that's right. all you're singing an e2 right so in that in that in that uh way of thinking though e1 becomes nothing to where or f1 let's say becomes nothing to where you don't fully appreciate a true f1 because there's such a saturation of it yeah yeah where i can i can totally respect that I can totally respect you know what I mean? that. Yeah. And I think in that vein, and again, this is even if I weren't a tenor, if I didn't exist, this is not a bias thing because I can say, you know, like I'll shout out another guy because, you know, I like to shout out the new, I don't know, the new generation, right? I'm, I'm old news, but like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but like Jojo, right? Who's a friend of mine too. Um, Jojo should get more love. Like you got to appreciate how rare a cat's voice like that is too. Yeah, right? I think we're in the same you know box of, of which there are a few. Yeah, but yeah, I've heard I've heard him hit you know F sharps and Fs and whatever, and that's much more noteworthy than an F one in subharmonics or chest fry or whatever. Right. right. Yeah. So I've gotten to, but I don't want to talk about me. So I'll say Jojo, right, or Eric, okay. whatever, or Eric Alatori, right? People should be freaking out over Eric Alatori, who's a legend of classical singing. He is a legend. Figure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. So I think it cheapens the appreciation for true basses, A, right? Um, B, and this is not specific to these techniques, but generally, I feel like in the last maybe 10 years since these techniques became more prominent, prominent yeah, yeah um, there's been an over focus on super low notes. While they are cool. That, yeah while i enjoy you know producing them and while they are impressive right especially when they're real um it's kind of created this uh, race to the bottom in a way to what you know and everybody's trying to be as low as they can even though a lot of times it doesn't sound great and a lot of times they're neglecting the fundamentals of singing and their upper register and style. <laughs> it's like, yeah. hold on, let's strip this thing down and just like look at it objectively and in a way that makes sense for the music. Like, yeah, does the yeah. music call for this low note, right? Does this, it, you know, it just, it, I feel like it just drives the the attention in the wrong direction. I, I, I can I can definitely see that and I can definitely understand that, per, mm -hmm. that line of thinking because at the end of the day too, you have to think about what goes with the arrangement. You have to think about what belongs in the music. You have to right. think about, like you were saying, you have to, f you can't just slam low notes all the time and right. ne neglect right. any other part of your voice. Because if you right. neglect one, I mean, if you, if you build one, you neglect the other. Yeah. hundred percent. Right? You got to do it all. Like <clears throat> you, you got to do it all. You know, I can't. And I will, I will say in knowing a lot of people that are, that have pretty much mastered multiple extended mm -hmm. techniques i can definitively say that there is a very strong saturation in music now at least in the last five to ten years with mm -hmm. low notes mm -hmm. and it's great being able to sing low notes and i love doing extended techniques myself mm -hmm. but on the same token there is a flip side of that coin where it becomes it, it makes low notes less special yeah Mm -hmm. in a way because people are like every time yeah. a low note hits but yeah like there's more and more and more and more of them and it makes people of your creed if you will mm -hmm. less special mm -hmm. and people and people will start to under appreciate a true low chest versus yeah. extended techniques because you've got tenors out here who can literally do stuff just as low as you but the, but that at the end of the day, you're you're the one that's doing it 100 percent naturally. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, and it's interesting too because, like, <laughs> I also feel like so with music, music is communication, right? Right. I also feel like it's a bit alien to, and not in a good way, to interrupt your musical thought to switch 
into a different, the, you know, type of singing, if you will. Right. That's like fair. it would yeah. be entirely <clears throat> unnatural for me to say this, you know, to talk to you right now and, um, you know, say once we get done, I'm going to go to the store. Like what? <laughs> Why did you do that? <laughs> right? Like, like it, it interrupts the idea just so you could flex. Like, I mean, to each their own, but, they, it, but it's never anything you'll hear me do. Yeah. For those, for those reasons. You know what I mean? Totally respectable point of view on that. And yeah. that's that's not something that's been discussed on the Focast before because there's yeah. always been this this love for extended techniques. And that's wonderful that we love extended techniques, but there nobody ever really talked about the negative side of extended techniques because it's people are all like gung ho about them and that's great, mm -hmm. but at the same time there's a negative side to it that not everyone talks about. Is yeah, it, it, I mean, you know, there's a positive and negative to anything, but that, that's 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 kind of how I feel about it. Totally and I, understandable. You know, one interesting thing about it too, I would say it's different. All those three techniques are different from something like because yeah, maybe this is me being a lawyer and trying to like think of you know presuppose certain arguments, but like falsetto, for example, right? That's mm -hmm. technically an extended technique too, mm -hmm. right? Not against falsetto by any means. Um, a people aren't going falsetto crazy for no reason like they are with low notes but right b um falsetto is different because you can do more with falsetto right, right? you can easily tra smoothly transition from your falsetto to mix to your chest in a nice melodic way mm -hmm. right you can do runs and trills and expressive things in falsetto that you would in your normal voice that you can't do if you're trying to you know fire breathe or growl or split the fundamental you but, know it's just uh i feel like it's it's more it's more gimmick than music than is, is my if, if i could summarize it totally makes sense man totally yeah. makes sense yeah bit of a hot take for sure but i can i'm totally on board with you on that it makes yeah. a lot of sense different jokes for different folks. Yeah, yeah definitely makes sense all right so um, two more, and then we'll take our quick intermission. Yeah. So do you have perfect pitch? This is not immediately obvious to me. No. <laughs> I mean, I've got pretty good relative pitch, right? But I, I wouldn't say I have perfect pitch. You told me to call out an A right now before we get close, but no. Okay, okay. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. So for those that didn't know, he does not have perfect pitch. Just no, I think that's just about useless. Um, a lot of people I know who have perfect pitch, right? I have to temper myself. Uh, are 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 not great singers. Not to say that's always the case, but oftentimes it's a it's a. I find that to be the case, and also, mm -hmm. man, it's funny. I would probably drive myself nuts if I had perfect pitch because then even tiny, like minuscule fluctuations, would be even more <laughs> noticeable. Yeah, to my age. That would be yeah. It's probably. Yeah, we're driving crazy. Yeah, I can't imagine what it's like for like yeah. for like Char Charlie Puth, for instance. Like he can yeah, yeah. he can tap a cup and he can tell you what pitch it is. And I'm, yeah, no, no, I'm like I, 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 I'm just... it draws me nuts too, for sure. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Last one for now, at least. What is one of your favorite things about being a singer? Mm. <sighs> about being a singer, it's awesome. I mean. I mean, it's it's different based upon kind of what kind of singer you are and everything, but I feel like it's something that so many people wish they had that I never want to take for granted, right? Like everybody wishes, whether you're a bass singer or whatever, everybody wishes they could belt out that Whitney Houston song that they love to do for your karaoke and not sound like a, a frog, yeah. right? Or wishes they could, you know, hit these crazy low notes with, with smoothness or whatever like it's it's kind of it's such a human thing um to to appreciate vocal uh performers and vocal greatness that i would call myself fortunate to be able to actually put out what i hear in my head right yeah so to speak and then also um it's great because i feel like i it, it it's easy for me to get ideas out you know to pull ideas from something i'm listening to or to translate ideas into an arrangement like thinking as a singer makes it easier to be a creative i feel like right or like if i'm picking yeah. up the bass i already 
have a lot of things in mind from being a bass singer and vice versa right you know what i mean so like i yeah, feel yeah, like yeah. it's a it's a language that kind of uh that that once you've mastered it pays a lot of benefits you know? it really does and it feels wonderful to be able to do it too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and maybe you know i'll add on to that too um i love that i can express eh, express myself in that way not necessarily emotionally and sometimes but more so like my unique individuality style yeah. wise but in terms of my instrument too so one of the reasons why i always gravitated towards like small group singing instead of choral singing is because i really find it special to hear the individual voices yes i have that right? passion too you know, because how these five guys sing this arrangement is entirely different from how these five guys are singing the arrangement because it has to do with their instrument and their style and their approach and their you know tone and all these other different things. Yeah. So that's really cool too to just like intermix with different contexts of singers and hear that combination of flavors. You know? Yeah, for sure. I'm I'm in the same boat, man. I love it. Yeah, it's a special thing. It really truly is. All right, so that gives us a quick little divider. We are through the traditional questions, so now you have the self-promotion piece. You have the floor for the next few minutes to advertise, yeah. share what you got going on, et cetera. Man, <laughs> we can keep it simple. I mean, um, like I said, you know, it's it's very intermittent that I release stuff. Um, you know, really, if you want to find all all the stuff that I've done, just search my name, you know, Elliot Robinson or Elliot Michael Robinson. You'll you'll find a lot. Uh, and since most of it, you know, I've got my YouTube channel, which is I think just Elliot Michael Robinson, um, which I will link in the me. description. Yeah, thank you. And then a lot. I mean, there's a lot more. There's a handful of things on there, but there's a ton more as far as collaboration. So check it out there. I did create. Uh, feel free to follow me on on Instagram. My uh, it's it's Elliot Michael Elliot with two L's and two T's. I put a link there in my bio. Um, of just like everything that's on streaming that I've done to pull it all in one place. You know, it's probably 10 different groups that I've worked with. Yeah. So that's there for anybody who wants to hear kind of more of a historical or maybe find a, a gym or two that they don't, uh, that they weren't aware of before because they're definitely out there. Things that never had a video or, or whatever else. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. And then I've got a couple of ideas that have just been kind of swimming in the back of my mind that I'm just trying to uh, find time to carve out, but I'm, really excited about them so feel free to subscribe and and when they are done you'll you'll be the first to know stay tuned folks this sounds interesting yeah, yeah. awesome guys we're excited to hear some of it, some more work of elliot's he's pushing out great music already and we want to hear sure. more for sure so stay tuned for that i will have all of his information linked in the description so be sure to check out his his pages and his music for sure for sure all right, section, if you're done for, if you're done with your self-promotion for this piece, this will also yeah. give you an opportunity to ask me any questions, should you have any. So you have the floor yeah. for that. So what's your, um, yeah, man, I mean, we can just run back a few of the ones that you asked me. Like, what would you say your biggest musical? Actually, let's back up. So how would you describe yourself? Oh, that's a... That's a pretty, that's a pretty broad one. Um, yeah. So I would consider myself a bass baritone singer that really loves acapella, okay. mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. super passionate about acapella. Okay. Um, I'm working up a plan to do some pretty cool music from the early two thousands. I'm Love wanting, it. I'm wanting to do an early two thousands sampler all acapella. No. Awesome. How old are you, man? I am 24. Okay. So this would have been stuff that you like your early, early days of it. Hearing yeah, music experience. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I truly have a passion for the old, early 2000 stuff. Of course, mm -hmm. I like I like all music. Yeah. But be, growing up in North Carolina, I do. Yeah. I do have a bit of a soft spot for country, but I, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I try to make sure I educate myself in all the music. Mm -hmm. But if I had to describe myself musically, I'd have to say that I'm a bass baritone, loves acapella. And okay. what got you in acapella? So I'm going to, I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be really basic and I'm going to have to say that the pentatonic mashups. Okay. Yeah. That and, um, like some of the early acapella, um, 
like southern southern gospel acapella stuff. Yeah, so, like I, the acapella group. Yes, that was, I was like, okay, I really enjoy the fact that there's people out there making music without instruments. Mm-hmm. Like this fascinates me, and it feels like it's a true display of skill and talent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I want to like I want to get myself stuck into this. Yep, it's yep. a heck of a rabbit hole. Yeah, oh for sure, for sure. Yeah, so many different avenues. But yeah, you know, I'm not surprised. PTX was kind of the entry point for a lot of people. I never thought I would see. Again, this is me dating myself, being old and whatnot. But I never thought I would see the day that acapella became like a thing, <laughs> a popular thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It sees the opportunity. So, 100%. it's it is it is crazy where it started versus where it is. Oh yeah, big time, big time. Mm-hmm. But back on track, I would I describe myself as bass baritone that just loves acapella. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm still trying to find that niche, but yeah. For sure. So who's your go-to group now? Like who's your because I mean there are so many different styles. Like what would you say your ear is most? Because even like pentatonic style has changed from the kind of more EDM influenced thumpy stuff to it's kind of I don't know what they're doing now, more of a lighter, poppy, slightly R and B thing, right? And then you've yeah. got voice play that's a little more theatrical and blah, whatever. A home free is more country and you got you know everybody else jazz groups or whatever what's kind of your i'm one of those people that just like i love it all but if i absolutely had to pick any one go-to group that would be my Mm -hmm. personal favorite i'd have to stick with vp just because they i just i don't know man it's just i I guess i just have a sweet spot for them now i know my my biggest groups were pentatonics and home free but Mm -hmm. I've, i've quickly grown to love vp in the past three to four years okay especially Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I just not that I don't love the others. It's just like that's I, I just I I look forward to VP because I just I love their music. I just I hear it and I'm like, yeah, okay, good stuff to listen to, man. Mm-hmm. I I really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. The quality control is through the roof. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, 100%. through the roof. They 100%. are super talented, and I yeah. I get a lot of inspiration from them. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can see that. Good guys too um yeah okay okay and then as far as a listener non-acapella like what's your what do you normally what's the first thing you go to hmm. or let's uh, maybe let's make it easier because you said you're all over the place what what are you listening to now like in the last week or two what are you really playing a bunch well i find myself doing like early 2000 stuff i find myself doing or listening to country because i'm because okay. i just grew up in the south that's kind of a kind of a and, you know, something that yeah, just yeah. kind of you're talking like like Josh Turner. You're talking Garth Brooks. You're talking all over the place, man. You all go of it. From, I, I, bounce, I bounce. I bounce from Morgan Wallen to Josh Turner to Brooks and Dunn. Okay. Oak Ridge Boys. All yeah, over yeah. the place. Mm-hmm. All over the place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can appreciate a good country song, man. I um, <laughs> when I was uh, when I was a kid, I don't know if they still have. Uh, I'm sure they still have them now in some places. But we had a roller skating rink in town and mm-hmm. two of the songs, one of my favorite songs back then was a country song. Like you wouldn't guess it because I'm not like a country listener or, you know, aesthetic guy. But, yeah, you know, but like two of the songs that I remember being played the most. And I think this is a good description of our town's kind of dynamic or makeup was um, like more bounce to the ounce or uh, cutie pie. Cutie Pie, which is, I forget the name of the band, but it's an old, like, 70s funk tune. So Cutie Pie, okay. that kind of stuff, Let It Whip, and then um, I always have it, this is my Guilty Pleasure song, and this is why it's relevant to the conversation. Uh, Boot Scootin' Boogie Man. Yes! <laughs> For some reason, I wasn't, you know, that's a classic. I literally yeah. listened to that yesterday. It's It just feels right, it feels good, man. Sold is another one that, like, I. it's just a... It's fun, man. That so is I, probably my favorite, and I've I've been want I've been like in the back of my brain, I've been wanting to find a way to cover that acapella, but I'm just yeah. my brain, But it's just like that's one of those songs where it moves so fast and it has it has so it moves at a pace where it would be difficult to do it acapella. You talking about sold or boot scoot boogie? Sold. Yeah, I mean, and also the home free version is probably in your head too, so it's hard to kind of break that, that. too. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I love yeah. it, man. That's that's some guilty pleasure songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
because it, it's, some of them are just so dang country that people are just not going to listen to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just have a high respect for like fast, like for those good old country songs. Yeah, like, yeah. especially the ones that move like like soul does is just super fast pace and just mm-hmm. it's just so much fun. Mm-hmm. John mm-hmm. Michael Montgomery is a legend. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, let's see, what else would you say? Okay, what's one of your if you could do life over again? I think it's different being in your twenties and thirties because you got you got more days than I do. But if you could, <laughs> if you could go back, uh, you know, ten. 15 years to do something different well, let's say musically and non-musically what would it be i would try i would have started singing earlier mm-hmm. and i would have trained my voice throughout my entire range more mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. ever since i figured out that i could sing i started singing probably when i was like maybe 12 13 14 somewhere in there mm-hmm. bless me i thought i was a bass back then i had an e flat too <laughs> okay yeah and i only focused on training my low range which huge mistake happens a lot yeah huge mistake in only narrowing having a narrow point of view and only training one piece mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. it may be evident some people may say that i have a good low range given that i'm a base berry but at the same at the same time like it's great to have a good low range, but I neglected my higher, my higher ranges back then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Where I have, where I sit in my range, my tessitura, as you can tell, I mean, yeah. speaking, speaking voices, obviously, I mean, it's not always a good indicator what kind of voice type you are, but yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can kind of tell that I reside in the, in the low third, second octaves. And, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and that's, Partially, like my low range is due to the fact that I was just obsessed with low range, and mm-hmm. I just it makes me. If I could go back and redo life at that age, I would have trained my high range more. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, definitely neglected. You know, I will say, you still got time. Like I don't think. I mean, I would say a lot of my vocal development, both in terms of style and range, was in my mid to late twenties. Like that was probably the biggest steps forward, like with the tools that I got in and the work that I started in college and whatnot, just like continuing to hammer things down. So it's, it's definitely not too late, but I feel you. I'm yeah, you. definitely. Yeah. That's definitely yeah. what I would do. I would practice my highs and mids more. Yeah. What about non-musically? Ooh, that's a good one, one thing you could. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I wish I would have focused more on myself. Okay. So it's, it's one, my, my parents have, my parents raised me to be more geared towards people and being a humble person, which Mm -hmm. I love my parents for that. I love that idea. And it's a great and noble thing to aspire for, but Mm -hmm. I did it so much. I put people before myself so much that I was neglecting myself. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. it, It, if you do that, there's there's a bit of a line where you start crossing to where you're starting to neglect yourself for other people. And 100%. it's noble, but it's it's toxic. Not it's yeah, just, yeah. And not sustainable, for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a bit of a threshold where you have to take care of yourself before you take care of other people. And 100%. I wish I had done that more. 100%. It's, yeah. it, is a, it is a good thing to do. but Yeah. No, I mean, and kudos for identifying that, right? Like, I think a lot of people, another thing about culture and society, it's so, everything is focused on externalities and immediacy and perfection and right now and and all this other stuff and projection, you know, projection of what you want yourself to seem like and, you know, all these other things. Right. But I feel like, um, you know, I wish more people would, focus on introspection right and identifying those those patterns that don't serve you so you know kudos for, for having identified that right off the bat yeah you know? and i still try to do the same thing like i i'm i'm all about doing for people and and hanging yeah, out yeah. oh people. yeah but yeah I, now i like to think there's that i balance. take better care of myself yeah yeah there's a good yeah. balance right yeah yeah 100 percent, 100 um what are you most excited about in life and not necessarily like in life philosophically but like right now what are you looking forward to most imminently i'm looking forward to the 
looking forward to where my this YouTube channel is going to go. And mm-hmm. I'm also looking forward to where my musical career could potentially go. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. knowing the growth that I've had over the last four months, I started this, in, I started doing all this in November. And okay. I've grown to a point to where I didn't think I would, I mean, I'm, I'm able to, I'm making money off of YouTube now, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I, I never thought I would succeed even to this level. And it's not even like, I, do, I pale in, in comparison to a lot of people, but yeah. it's, it's, I'm excited to see where this, the, the this channel could go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That and my, my ability to work in the music industry because mm-hmm. it didn't register to me that I had a, like a voice that actually people would want to listen to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so with that said, it's really exciting to know that people want to hear my voice so if people want to hear my voice, I'm excited to see where I can go in the music industry. Hundred yes. percent. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a huge breakthrough for me lately, and I'm, it mm-hmm. makes me excited for the future for sure. Yeah, the sky's the limit, man. You know, like we said, it's uh, the gatekeep. There's the, the, there's not gatekeepers as there were, you know, 10, 20 years ago, right? Yeah. It, everything is out in the open, and if you've already got you know, following, then that just is easy to build on and spread with consistency and, you know, your own continuing to develop and define yourself, you know, so. Definitely, man. Definitely. I feel that. Well, let's see what else. What would you say? Did we get to your biggest influences? Uh, Not yet. Yeah, let's do that. Musical. Biggest musical influences. Um, So you've worked on the bass gang before. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Acapella first, then we'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. So the bass gang, Tommy uh, P, his community, the the bass nation. Mm-hmm. I can attribute a lot of my musical confidence, um, more or less, the vanishing away of my imposter syndrome, and Good. a lot of other musical things. I can attribute a lot of that to his or Tommy's community and the bass mm-hmm. gang's community. Mm-hmm. I mean, because I consider them all friends of mine now. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. having them on the podcast and just hearing them say that they they'd like to hear music of my own and just they mm-hmm. they given me a confidence boost. It's truly like humbling. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And the bass gang, I have to say, all all five of them, including Casper, have just been a bit been a huge influence on me. Yeah, yeah. as far as um, acapella and the voice side of music. Um, there is, there are two individuals in my personal life that have also made a huge difference. Um, primarily Daniel Jarvis, who is a, um, he was a, he was my band director in high school. Okay. And, um, I'm not sure if he watches any of my videos, but if you are watching this, Daniel, thank you for everything you've done. You've truly pushed me to a point to where I can be confident in my music ability and, um, my middle school band director was also the same way. Uh, ben Rhodes, he was awesome. Love it. Yeah, yeah. Those are my biggest musical inspirations for sure. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. You know, it's funny. You never. It just kind of goes back to what I was saying before. You never really. I don't know. Maybe like you never really in the moment appreciate how impactful something or someone is going to be to you, right? And I right. think the same through if you flip it, like. I feel like we all have the opportunity through the art we make or even just how we exist in the world to impact someone or something for the better, right? Like with all the stuff that I've been blessed enough to do in music or involved in music, um, I'm sure, you know, those groups that I saw 20 years ago or 25 years ago or listened to or whatever, would have never expected that they would, you know, impact this guy to go from being a math nerd to being a, (laughs) to be a music musician. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, um, yeah. Or like the, like I said, the forever plan, right. Whoever those guys were, that base was, you know, you never know who's in the crowd that that is going to light a spark. Right. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's amazing. I'm glad base game. Those are all great guys. And, you know, like you said, with your prior directors, it's, it's just, awesome to acknowledge that spark and i don't know like 
toast to you know may we all spark something else in in, in somebody a little bit younger you know what i mean that's right. the goal you know so yeah definitely yeah it's good yeah. stuff man yeah let's see i'm trying to think let's uh, if we can end, end with a with a banger let's see let's go way outside of um of acapella stuff go for it what um let's see here give me so not related to music at all what are the three let's okay let's do it this way what outside of music what are you a fan of two or three things like it can be a sports team it can be a, a, a f- cuisine type it can be a you know a brand of shoes whatever three things that i really love yeah fitness being one of them okay. um i absolutely love doing anything health fitness related i love yeah. aspiring to be a better person every day through fitness yeah um for those that don't know, I am Christian, so I do go to church all the time. That's something I'm also very passionate about. Mm-hmm. But I'm I am very careful to mention on YouTube just to be on the safe side of, you know, not alienating anyone in particular just because I'm talking about things that, you know, could be something that no people would disagree with. Yeah. So okay. I try to avoid stuff like that. But for those that don't know, I am very passionate in my faith. And so that's two things. If I had something else, I'd have to say fitness, my faith, Christianity. Uh, I really love cars. Okay. I I absolutely love fast cars, and I okay. will talk to you about them for hours. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. I can absolutely yeah. – I just – I love sports cars. And I love muscle cars. I could okay. tell – I mean, I couldn't get into the nitty gritty and tell you about like bores of an engine and stuff like that. But yeah, okay. I like I like stuff like I have I had a couple of pretty pretty quick cars, and I I could mm-hmm. talk talk to you about them for hours. But okay, so those are some of thing. my some of my other hobbies and passions for sure. Okay, let's end with this one. Let's say um, with how are you feeling today? Right, your answer may change tomorrow, but if you were to give. Like, what would you say is your word, words of advice to the world? Words of advice to the world. Or to your likely listener, right? So maybe we cut out people who are, you know, 80 or (laughs) whatever, right? Or kids. But like to the general adult population, let's say, or youth and adult population. If I had to say any one thing, I would say this one's get this one may sound a little bit deep, but it's not going to be that bad. Support each other more and worry less about what you believe in. Okay. Um, this world is truly a hateful place. Oh, yeah. In mm-hmm. in every way, people find ways to be toxic to each other. 100%. And my my view on the world is that if, if you don't like me, if I don't like you, cool. Yeah. But yeah. It doesn't matter. 100%. We yeah. all have the same world to live in. We all have... Yeah. We all have the same things to, you know, if we don't, if we agree to disagree and there's, to me at least, there's no reason to be toxic to other people just because you disagree on something. If there's no reason, like, it's, this is something that I like to talk about in the music industry too, that not a lot of people will, is that just because someone has a certain political belief doesn't mean you shouldn't support them per se. I mean, you have the right not to, but let's just say... Um, I think there was something going on. I remember in the past people were like, Eric Church believes X, Y, Z about guns. And I'm like, doesn't make, it doesn't make any difference to me. I mean, like I have, I have my beliefs. They may not totally align with his, but I still like his music. So I'm going to support his music. If if my belief about if, for example, if my belief about firearms doesn't align with his, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I love yeah. his music, so I'm just going to support his music. Yeah, right? I feel that. I feel that. There's no reason yeah. to be toxic in this world, guys. So, I mean, yeah. like, be good to people. Yeah. Yeah. Because okay. that's, I'd have to say that would probably be my biggest thing. Support each other regardless of what you think, what you believe. I think that's valid. I think that's valid. I mean, I think with the caveat, there are some things that are so uh, 
heinous to believe or do. Egregious. They, yeah. Well, yeah. They, but, they but fall without. That. Yeah, yeah. They, they'll exactly. fall outside of that scope for sure. Yeah. But no, I'm with you because, yeah, you're right. Everybody's just doing their best, right? And everybody's, I mean, man, everybody has different experiences that shape how they view the world and that shapes how they order their values, which in the big, their values are likely the same, but just how they see them or how they see certain things impacting those values is different. Like everybody's just doing their best. So exactly. And it's just, there's just yeah. no reason. There's just no reason for it. Right. Yeah. No, I feel that. I feel Support that. people. Support people, folks. Yeah. I dig that. I can go sign that. Sweet. So is that all you've got for me in this point? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good, that's I got a good you. point. All right. So we've got just a couple or just a small few of uh, community submitted questions and then we'll wrap this boy up. Cool. All right. So these have been gathered from several different sources, comes from Discord, YouTube, social media, etc. Yeah. So this one comes from Base Krispies. As an attorney, did you ever deal with cases surrounding copyright laws? And more specific, <clears throat> were there any with any groups that you were affiliated with? Um <laughs> the short answer is no. Um, because here's, here's the thing. So I went to law school and even before getting out decided, yeah, I don't think I want to practice. <laughs> so, you know, but still, um, being that my bachelor's degree was in music, uh, commercial music to be exact. It's like, well, you know, let me go ahead and finish, uh, because might as well have those doors open. Should I choose to walk through them? Right. So that's what I did. Finished the degree. My last year I was touring and doing law school, which is crazy. Took the Illinois bar exam, passed the first try, thank goodness. And um, yeah, so since then, you know, I went back to music right after that and then took a job kind of in the legal department of a um, large corporation. Uh, and I've kind of worked through that corporation in different roles, but um, in, in, in any sense, no, right. Haven't done any copyright cases. I've researched in copyright law for different reasons before um, yeah. through my job. But as far as like representing a group or an entity for that kind of thing, no. Um, gotcha. But I mean, groups do find themselves in, in that kind of hot water sometimes. Fortunately, none that I've that I've worked with. But I know like Take Six recently um, had a IP case. And I'm guessing I had to doubt it. But it was for one of their songs. And it, was a, it, it wasn't against them, but um, some artist ripped a sample from one of the take six tracks right so they were suing i think it was her or a scissor or somebody who sampled there you know so it's it's definitely a part of you know uh artist life and considerations for sure definitely man this one comes from um this one comes from element of surprise he's asking what is the funniest or most memorable reaction to your voice <laughs> funniest or most memorable um it's always funny man it's always funny i mean <laughs> because crowds will you know gasp or shriek and you know that's always what it is and then you know i'm a fairly you know, i work out and stuff too right and you can you can tell but back before i did any of that and i was you know 134 pounds or whatever uh as an adolescent folks never expected this voice to come out of me you know what i mean so yeah, that was yeah. a really funny thing too um i've had people say and do some really really funny stuff uh again <laughs> a lot of it can't be on this podcast but uh there's right. been several i'll just go with the the different types of, of you know gasp and shock and awe in different countries it's, yeah for sure it's, it's, yeah for sure um this one comes from fernie the guy that i worked on a cover with um is there any you have any uh music coming soon so whatever you're able to provide you gotta wait and see you gotta keep wait and see. suspense man gotta gotta th keep that suspense to keep the mm -hmm. excitement mm -hmm. this one also comes from um element of surprise um can can you briefly explain or like what has your vocal journey been like like if you were to sum it up what yeah. would you say it was like yeah if i'm to sum it up it would be initially exposure to gospel right take six and the acapella company being a big part of that and r b eh, not really caring about music a whole lot as a young kid 
rediscovering it around the time that my voice hit rock bottom at 11 or 12 and that kind of coalesced with uh you know discovering like i said forever plaid and all those other things more into boys to men and all those things and then yeah i mean uh, just finding ways to um expand my skill set from there and and style abilities and arranging abilities since then because it's really a never-ending conquest right you never win the game with your voice or with an instrument or there's always something new to to learn so uh yeah i'm thankful i've been able to make leaps and bounds in that regard over the last 20 or however many years and excited to reach new territory yeah for sure man um let's see the next one is from bass krispies again um what is the biggest legal mistake up and coming music artists make if i don't even know if i yeah I don't, that's 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 such a specific <laughs> yeah i mean without getting into like hey that's not really my world for real like i like i said i don't practice but honestly mm -hmm. i have a big mistake that one could make and like I said, with that um, example with take six is not thinking about, you know, clearing samples or getting the rights to this song or the rights to cover, you know, that kind of stuff. Can yeah. definitely get in hot water, especially, uh, you know, whether you are a semi-prominent artist or newer and trying to break through having to pay a judgment would suck for you. <laughs> so don't be Indeed. dumb. So there you go. Yeah. Indeed, for sure. Uh, this one comes from. Well, let me make sure. Okay, we've already answered that. Let me check this other tab that I have to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Uh, we had one mention. Um, happy belated birthday back on the 19th. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so I appreciate that. 36? 36. I'm an 36. adult twice over, man. <laughs> my third round. <laughs> <laughs> on the on the journey. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, man. Let me check this last tab, and then we should be able to wrap this up. All right. So, yep, yeah, that just about does it for the community uh, related questions. So we will be cool. wrapping this up for the day. If there's anything that you have to say that you would like to say before we close her down, you you have the floor to do that. And I will be thinking about it as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. It's been nice to just kind of chat both about music stuff, Aka stuff and just personal life stuff. Like I, I really enjoyed this. For sure. Um, Thanks to everybody, you know, out there who who's watching and hopefully you took away something either to change how you think about something or inspire you to, you know, go after whatever your dream is or approach music a certain way. Um, yeah, I mean, I just yeah, I, I appreciate the engagement. And like I said, subscribe if you want to follow along with what I'm doing. Um, there will be more without a doubt. And yeah, if you're watching. Do your thing. Be your best you and work on it every day. You know, I ask you the question about words of advice or whatever. If I was to say the same thing just to kind of send it off, I would probably say do everything with intention. Do Try everything it. with intention, folks. This has been a wonderful opportunity to have Elliot with us. We learned a lot about him today. We may have to have him on again at some point. We'll see um, as time allows. And, uh, yeah, we're going to wrap this one up. I'll have all of his information linked in the description. And... It's been great. I've been, yeah, I've loved yeah, having you on. Pleasure, and um, we are wrapping this one up. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Vocast. We love you. Take care of yourselves, and we will see you in the yeah. next one. Bye. Thanks.